Thank you for tuning into the Apostolic Pentecostal Church podcast. You are currently listening to one of our iGrow series lessons. If you're in the Bloomington, Illinois area and want to sit in person, feel free to join us Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. for Bible study and Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. for worship in the Word. Can't make it in person? No big deal. Find us on YouTube, Facebook, or Instagram and search Apostolic Pentecostal Church. Either way, we'd love to fellowship and worship with you. We hope to see you. So we had to have two classes because one hour just wasn't enough, right? That's right. <laughs> That's probably what you said when you went home. One hour just wasn't enough. Let's do two more. hours. Um, so, but biblical parenting really isn't just one hour or one half hour or one hour, 45 right. minutes, however long we make it tonight. Um, and we'll make you ask questions. So get your questions ready. Uh, biblical parenting is about training uh, for your lifetime uh, because once we're a parent we never stop being a parent uh, we talked last week to Mom, Grandma Plu about how old her children were and the the needs of the kids for us might change but we don't stop being parents it's not like you hit a magical age um, maybe your parent doesn't parent you this way maybe you should go talk to them but it's not like we hit a magical age and then our parents just disappear from our life. You know, the Bible is all about the patriarch, the family, um, going all the way back to Abraham, you know, through generations. It was that male father figure. Well, the mother was there also, you know, because without the mother there wouldn't be any children uh, as well. So it's important for the parents to continue to pass that down to the kids. And that just doesn't happen for a short amount of time. Uh, the needs change. Uh, but biblical parenting should continue till Jesus calls us home. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to give a quick summary of last week uh, because we did hit three of the uh, parenting traits last week. And then Cindy's going to jump in and she's going to pick up where we left off with godly consistency uh, because that's the one that everybody's waiting for is that godly consistency. How do you consistently raise that child um, when they consistently get on your nerves? Right, honey? <laughs> Um, so we started last week with understanding that biblical parenting is not about making our kids better. So if you came to this class to try to make your kids better, this isn't a class for that. This is a class to make us better, to help us grow, to be the parents that God has called us to be so our kids can be the kids that God has called them to be. So it, it kind of works together. Uh, I know a lot of times when it, we talk about parenting, we think that if we could just straighten that child up, everything would be all right, but really it's when you can straighten this up, right. that child will be all right, because that, that child is looking for some of the things we talked about last week. Uh, we established at the very beginning of the class that children are a blessing. Mm -hmm. Yes, all children are a blessing. I have a little story, um, and it, it fits into the societal perspective the way that we view kids nowadays. I had an interaction with a young man. This young man isn't in church. This young man is strung out on drugs. This young man has alcohol addiction deep in his life. This young man has a really uh, past, a worldly past. And he come to me and his head was down and he was distraught and he was just telling me how things were going and he was explaining what his life was going on. And then he hits me with, and I'm going to be a dad. And so, he's looking down because he is so, there's so much shame on him. Not, not just from the fact that he's going to be a dad and he's out of marriage. And, and I don't condone children out of wedlock, so please don't take this the wrong way and look into this any more than what it is. But, but he's sitting there and he's, he's so much shame. And I got to thinking about our class and how all kids are blessings. And I just said, congratulations. And, and, he, and he, like, he stopped, and he lifted his head, and he looked at me, almost like, what? Con congratulate? I said, you know that all kids are blessings, right? And he said, but you don't understand. I said, then I had the opportunity to speak into his life and say, no, you don't understand, because now your life needs to change. Now it's not about you, it's about somebody else. But I, I think society, and clearly you can tell by the abortion rates and stuff like this, 
kid, kids are just a burden. And we, we got onto that a little bit last week. You're never going to be able to afford a child. If you're waiting to have a child to afford it, you're not going to be able to. And, and at some point, the, the biblical decree is that we are to be fruitful and multiply. And when we step outside of that, we start to step into our own. Well, I don't want to have kids because it will take away from what I'm able to do, blah, 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 blah. If you want to hear more about that, we got into that last week on the podcast. So, uh, But children are a blessing. And we went to Psalms uh, 127, 3 through 5. And I've been using the Amplified. Um, King James verbiage for me is just a little bit much, so I go to the Amplified when I have to read aloud. And it says, Behold, children are a heritage and a gift from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. How blessed, happy, and fortunate is the man whose quiver is filled with them. Uh, they will not be ashamed when they speak with their enemies in gatherings at the holy city gate. Um, how, how much blessed we are to have kids. Yeah. Those of you that had kids, can you say that you're blessed? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can? Mm-hmm. That's so good. <laughs> I'm glad. Mm-hmm. Some days or all days? All days. All days. That's good. You're better than me. Some days are better than others. <laughs> uh, oh, we're not supposed to be honest. We're just supposed to... Uh, sorry. Uh, so, children learn from us. So, in order to be biblical parents, we need to make sure that we're willing to live a biblical life. And that's the most important uh, number one step after realizing that children are blessed. We can't expect our children to be godly children if we're not godly parents. It is really hard to expect something out of them that we're not doing ourselves. But we do it all the time. Uh, We do it all the time. So uh, we discussed three of the four godly traits that were key to biblical parenting last week. Uh, We got to number one, godly kindness. Do you have a slide? No slides. Uh, Godly kindness, Uh, we discuss the meaning of kindness as a parent and making sure we're not lords over our children uh, and taking parental authority too far. Uh, We talked about that the love, uh, we'll get into that some principles tonight, but we talked about love and and a lot of times as parents we become lords over our kids and we like to hold that above their heads um, and we like to make sure that they know that we're in charge, that, that we are the run, one that runs this place. But really, that's not what it's about because that's not what God does to us. Right. So if God doesn't do that to us, we really shouldn't do that to them. Because if God did that to us, we really wouldn't like it. Mm-hmm. And then we wonder why our kids rebel because we're, we're not uh, coming to them with kindness and understanding. We're coming to them with an iron fist. And when you have an iron fist pushed down on you so much, you're just going to try to go in the opposite direction uh, as much as you can. So then we got to number two, godly correction. Um, And there were some scriptures that we read, Proverbs 13, 24. uh, He who withholds the rod of discipline hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines and trains him diligently and appropriately with wisdom and love. Now I know what you're saying. You're thinking, well, you just said we shouldn't hold an iron fist over him. And I am. I'm saying the same thing because godly correction isn't about always the rod. Sometimes godly correction, most of the time godly correction is how he ends it with wisdom and love. And so we can be so quick because of our emotions and because of our feelings to be caught up in the moment that that we don't um, use wisdom, love, and understanding in discipline. We immediately go to the hand. But godly correction is not about the hand. Remember, God doesn't, he's waiting, he's sitting on his mercy seat. He's not on the judgment seat. So he's not judging us right now. And, but we're so quick as people to judge, 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 judge. And we do the same thing to our kids. Um, and then we went to Proverbs 25, 15. And it says, be patient, and cal- be patient and a calm spirit. A ruler may be persuaded and a soft and gentle tongue breaks the bone of resistance. So maybe, just maybe when our kids are acting out, it deserves a tone, a soft tone. Not one that goes all the way up here. Because I like to go from zero to 60 and make sure everybody hears me. But maybe really what they need is just a calm, smooth demeanor. You do the same thing. (laughs) (laughs) So godly godly correction is oftentimes not about the rod, but communication and understanding. Judgment with the rod uh, is there, uh, but it's like our lives. It's been covered with mercy and grace and long-suffering. And we talk about the fruits of the Spirit. We talk about love, joy, peace. We miss long-suffering a lot of times. One, because it's a big word. But two, because of what it really means. We don't really want to have long-suffering. We 
we want it to be done and we want it to be done now. But really, to have to be a godly individual as well as a godly parent, we need that long suffering. We've got to display that long suffering. Uh, then we got into godly structure. Uh, we discussed how children long for this, and when we don't provide structure, it is like we don't love our children at all. And we get that from Hebrews 12 and 8. Now, if you are exempt from correction uh, and without discipline, in which all of God's children share, then you are an illegitimate child and not sons at all. So, talking about the Lord, the Lord provides us with a structure, with a plan, with promises to get us to move in the right direction. And if we just lax with our children and don't provide them with any of that, then it's almost like we don't care or love them at all. Um, much, uh, much the same as God provides structure and plans for us. Um, that's, so that's kind of where we got last time. We got to the three principles. And Cindy is going to pick up with the godly consistency. All right, so our fourth uh, box is godly consistency, and I'm sure nobody remembered to bring back your papers, and that's okay. I didn't print any more out either. Um, Naomi, that's had horrible it. parenting, by the way. If you forget to bring back your papers, that's just bad. <laughs> we probably need a third class. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Ryan brought his. Yeah, get up, here, Ryan. Teach the class. <laughs> Naomi had asked last week a question about, you know, what do you do when they, they don't listen? You know, how do you handle that? And we had talked about godly consistency and how important it is just to be consistent. If you set a boundary and the kid crosses it, you, you have an obligation to hold up your end of the bargain. You know, if you do that, then this is going to happen. We have to be consistent. We don't want to have so many rules that no one can ever remember. Um, have you seen like the, there's sometimes a picture people put on their wall, so they'll say family rules, and it will have, you know, like 10 rules written down. I think that's a manageable number, like love each other, don't speak in hatred, you know, use kind words. Those are manageable, but if you've got rules for everything, um, then it's going to be really hard for the kid to keep track of it. And I just kind of think of like grandma or our parents, you know, as they're older, you think, oh, don't, don't do this, oh, don't touch that, oh, don't pick up that ball, you're going to choke on it, oh, don't run, you're going to fall. You know, there's so many, as, I think as people get older, the, the caution becomes a lot more elevated, um, but we want to make sure that they know that there's set rules to follow. It's not just, you know, a bunch of do's and don'ts, but things that they, there's purpose behind. And we do know um, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and his word never changes. So we don't want to be someone who wavers and our word changes all the time. So we need to make sure that kids know our rules. Don't expect them. Something that I think Jessica um, displayed so beautiful was a while back, um, there was something with Ryder she was dealing with, and she made a comment on Facebook about, you know, he thought what he was doing was perfectly fine. Um, it was a situation where uh, a lot of people were quiet and respectful, uh, and he had no idea. He hadn't been in a situation like that before, and maybe was doing cartwheels or flips and didn't, didn't, wasn't able to gauge the crowd and, and determine this is maybe not the time for me to be showing off my new skills. Um, but they don't know that. We haven't always been able to teach them how to behave in every situation. So it is our job to set those rules. You know, even if we don't think about it, you know, before we go to a situation, we're not like, okay, during this you need to stay quiet. You need to sit in your seat. We just need to, to set out some boundaries, make them realistic. Remember their age. They're not going to be able to be perfect at three, um, as good as they could be at maybe 13. But be consistent with your word. God's word doesn't change, and our words should not change either. So we want to make sure our thoughts are known to our kids. They can't read our mind. If we tell them to just stop it and there's no why, then they don't really learn anything other than just obedience to their parent. That is a valuable thing. But then when they're not with you, the why is not there. So we want to make sure they do fully understand the why of why they should or should not be doing that. And inconsistency will breed confusion. And God, we know, he is not involved in confusion. If we say, no, don't do that, and we punish them, and then the next day they do it and we just are like, whatever, well, they're confused, and they're going to just keep doing it, and they're not going to take us serious. They're not going to think that we really are going to enforce them. And then maybe five or six times down the road, if we're like, I told you not to do that, whack. You know, then they're like, wait a minute, 
I did it many other times between here and there, and you got, you're inconsistent. And that is, as a parent, we want to do better than that. So if you praise something one day and not the next, that is inconsistent. And something that as a parent that we're really, at least I am really, um, I need to improve upon is we are really easy to pick out the faults. Like, don't do that. You, you know, I notice that you're doing this. I know you can't do that. But we're not so quick to praise. But we need to be consistent in our praise too. If they obeyed and we caught that, that's a moment of praise, and they're going to grow more from the words of um, you know, praise than they are from the punishment. So just try to keep that in mind, is more praise um, will lead to less punishment. Now, if you have multiple kids, this is a little bit unique for me to say, but if you have multiple kids, they should be treated the same way, they should be parented the same way, except for age-related <laughs> things. <laughs> Um, but all kids should be treated the same. And I do find that a little bit difficult because I find that certain kids, have, as they grow, you learn their personalities are different. And I will definitely use our children because you all know them. But the way that we parent Ashlyn and the way that we parent Landon, um, are, of course, they're the same. They live in the same household. They have the same rules. But we get on to one child a whole lot more than we do the other. One is a rule follower and a people pleaser. And one just is, knows everything and doesn't really, you know, th there's just a difference between personalities there. And so, yes, we do parent them exactly the same. They know our expectations and rules. But you do also have to, um, you have to really pray about it and try to figure out what's most effective for a strong-willed child. If you have a strong-willed child, Jessica, you have to get creative, don't you? <laughs> yes. So good luck to all those parents with strong-willed children. Um, but they, they, will, they will find the inconsistency. Like that's why the consistency is so important here and then what comes out of here because they will find that. And that feeds into exactly what they're looking for. They're they're not they're rebellious by nature. We've all been born into sin, right? right. And until they achieve that relationship with the Lord and, and have the Spirit and then walk in the Spirit, you know, they're still fighting the flesh the same way that we fight the flesh. And so they're they're literally like Eve in the garden, dancing around that tree, walking around that tree, just waiting for the inconsistency to come out so they can eat of the fruit. And so it's, it, when we think of consistency, we all think, yeah, we're consistent. We make it to church every Sunday. But consistency is more about being here to be there consistently. Because if you're not here, well, if I'm, not, if I'm in a mood, I'm going to say something. And then if she's in a mood, she's going to say something. And then they're going to do that battle back and forth. So it, it is probably one of, if not the biggest of the four things up there to make sure that you and your spouse are on that same page. Um, because if not, it, it, it can get out of control pretty quick and then you realize she said something, you said something, now it starts an argument between you. Right. And whatever correction you were trying to do, it's gone. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> it is true. And I like what Josh said is that uh, they were born into sin just like we are. We were. And we are. But if you think about it, we've got a lot more practice of recognizing sin, of learning what is right and wrong. We've been doing this for a while, and they are they just don't understand fully the consequences of sin. And sometimes the best thing that we can do is kind of let them have those consequences. I know we want to protect them and not let anything bad happen to them. If you're like, don't do that, you're going to fall. Don't do that, you're going to fall. Well, then they fall. You know, and you just kind of be like, well, this is a consequence of not listening. You know, you know so that's sometimes one of the greatest teachers is, is learning um, their own consequences of not listening. But, um, so, as we were talking about different rules for different kids, we do notice that, you know, if you're not consistent with the children, then they do say, oh, you fav you're showing favoritism. You can that's not fair. You don't set those boundaries for the other sibling, that's not, why do I have to have these boundaries? They don't have those. Why is my time get turned off earlier than their time gets turned off? Why do I only get one hour of social media and they get two hours of social media? You know, they do catch that. Um, and then it is a good opportunity to explain why. 
But uh, you also want to be careful because the Bible says that God is not a respecter of persons. So you want to be careful that they don't interpret that as favoritism. That there's a reason why this is, and it's not because I favor them over you, because I value you both the same, but it's for just different personalities. Unless it's the baby. <laughs> he has boundaries. <laughs> don't want to tell you. But don't make a rule that you don't intend to force. Yeah. So, and Josh kind of alluded to this last time. If you spill that cup again, you're never going to have another <laughs> glass of water, you know. You're never going to enforce that. But sometimes we do get really dramatic. Like, um, if you don't listen to me, I'm grounding you for a month. Well, how many of us really can ground someone for a month? I mean, that is so hard to do. Why would you ever? That is more work on the parent than it is on the child to ground them for a month. So we want to make sure that it's something that we can enforce and that it is um, applicable to the crime. You know, like if they did something so small. you got to save those big ones for the, you know, the big mistakes if they ever get there. Um, so parents do need to work together. The inability of parents supporting or agreeing with one another creates uncertainty in the kids, and we just talked about that. And then don't do what you tell your kids not to do. How many of us are guilty for that? You cannot eat after, or you cannot eat before supper. It'll ruin your appetite. And then here we are snacking on our supper, you know, and so we it's it's a confusing message that we can send to our children. So we want to be consistent and not create a double standard. And godly consistency breeds an atmosphere for the Spirit of the Lord to operate. And that really is something that we all want in our home. More than anything, we want the presence of God to be able to operate and flow freely in our home. And if we're actually inconsistent, then that brings confusion, and it actually is going to stifle the presence of God. So as mothers, I know very specifically that's a role that we, uh, we try to cultivate in our home. So we want to make sure we're also in line with our husband and we're being consistent um, with our children. And then Colossians 3.21, it says, Fathers, do not provoke or irritate or exasperate your children with demands that are trivial or unreasonable or humiliating or abusive, nor by favoritism nor indifference. Treat them tenderly with loving kindness so they will not lose heart and become discouraged or unmotivated with broken spirits. And we read this last week, but it was worth bringing it up again because it again talks about favoritism or indifference. And I wanted to pull out again that it does mention fathers and that this is something that um, fathers need to be able to treat tenderly with loving kindness. That's not just the role of a mother. That is also the role of a father. Yeah, that's, <clears throat> that's important. We're dealing with a, a society that is suffering from mental health in a lot of different ways. And I... Uh, I'm not on Facebook a lot, but I recently saw something in regard to children and the church, and really it's the parents' responsibility, not the church's. We, we should bring our ch children to church whenever the doors are open, but we should be having church at home yeah. more than we're thinking that Brother Aaron and Sister Erica are going to raise our kids for the 30 minutes of actual time they get with them, um, an hour a week. You know, that, that's asking a lot um, uh, uh, <clears throat> on the church <clears throat> when we're not showing that consistency in our homes. And there's a great thing about biblical parenting. If you're not in that point right now, that's great. That's fine. It's called repentance. We do this on Sunday. We just This is our same walk. You ask the Lord for forgiveness, and then you move His way. That, that's, that's the whole point of the class. It's, it's not that we're standing up here perfect because we're not. Uh, we said that last time, but every time I talk about it, I've got to make sure you know. I'm not, it's not, we're not here looking down. It's we're in the same walk in March as everybody in this room. You're either now or going to be someday. But the idea is to have that biblical consistency on every avenue. We, we can't be biblical when we walk through the doors of the church. And demons when we're at home, and how we how we treat uh, our children, and then expect them to model and replicate that when we walk through the doors of the church, we're just supposed to put that proverbial smile on, and everything's supposed to be okay because they're not. What they're going to do is they're going to be terrors, and then they're going to why are your kids terrors? I'll show them when I get home, and then it's just a repetitive cycle. And so we need to have that consistency. When I think of consistency, I think of uh, when the Lord uh, delivered the Hebrews from the Egyptian bondage and he took them out into the wilderness. There was a reason for training. 
We, we only have a short time, literally, with our kids. And that has to be the most important training that we ever do. Soul winning, discipleship, forget about it. If you have children, that's where it starts. And we have to start there. That, that's how important we have to make it, because that is the next generation of the church. If we neglect our own family because we're worried about lost souls, God's probably smacking his head up in heaven going, what are you talking about? I just gave you four or five kids to, to be the next generation of the church. So why don't you start there, and then that will blossom out into something else. So it, when, when the Lord took the children of Israel into the wilderness, how, how long? Does anybody remember how long they were out there for? 40 years. 40, I was, it was a rhetorical. I was, maybe not rhetorical, but 40 years, right? 40 years. They were out there wandering. Why? Because it took them that long to train. Train them. To separate them from the world. We have kids that we get less time with them when we go to work and come home than what the school systems have. Than what the church has. And so we have to make sure that every minute, because now we deal with devices, mm -hmm. yep. every kid has a device. And if they don't, we give it to them to shut them up. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have to deal with the, the amount of time we have. And when we look at the biblical example, God separated them to take them out into the wilderness to teach them. They still made mistakes out in the wilderness. Half of them didn't even get to go into the promised land. But eventually, and so when we talk about consistency, it's not just a one day. It's a life. It literally is a lifetime of, of teaching. And 40 years in the wilderness, I, I, I think we should still be receiving or giving correction when our kids are 40. It shouldn't be, well, you're grown now. You take care of yourself. You're not grown. Mm -mm. You haven't lived near the life that we've lived. You, you haven't, you're not that old. Um, but anyway, does anybody have any questions? I asked you last week to come with some questions. Uh, did anybody uh, anybody got any questions before I go on? Yes, ma'am. I don't have a question, but I really like what you said about um, when you uh, when you tell your children not to do something, following it up with a why. Because I feel like, especially like with with my kids, um, when I started incorporating that, like giving them their like, why don't we do this? Okay. Or we're about to walk into a situation or an unknown kind of thing, following it up with a why, and you know, or or even um, for uh, I can't think of a situation obviously off the top of my head, but um, I just have seen that it gives them that that confidence to be more obedient, to just say, okay, my parents just told me why. I'm going to listen to them. I trust them. There's like another level of trust that I, I, I find with my kids, especially like Layla who's older yeah. um, can understand a little bit more. Yeah. yeah, you add to their understanding. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a, that's, when we talk about, Bible, when we talk about the Bible to people of our own age, like I'm going to witness to her. Mm -hmm. I just don't say, because the Bible says. Right. It, it just doesn't happen. And, and we, are, we are very intelligent. Our intelligence is, is growing and growing and growing. So what makes us think, because my dad used to say, because I said so. <laughs> How many of you have repeated that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, because you said so. And what do your kids do? Yeah. They don't care. <laughs> they don't care what you have to say. Also, there's a... Yeah. Right. Also, there's just a level of wisdom passed down. Yes, Because it's true. wisdom is supposed to be passed down from generation to generation. Right. It's not something you can just learn. And God does give us wisdom. And God mm -hmm. has given us wisdom, obviously. Mm -hmm. Through our children, we're learning and seeing these things. So that's another another added bonus to giving them that additional step of why can't I touch the fire? Well, because you're going to get hurt. And then past getting hurt, you're going to have to go and you're going to feel pain for a long time. Right. Like, I mean, that's simple. But, I mean, there are other situations that yeah. are just easier to talk about. Yeah, well, wait until they get to ask biblical questions. Yeah. And you have not had that conversation with them younger to pass wisdom down. And now they begin to question certain things, standards. They begin to question holiness. They begin to question who God is on us. And all you say is, it's because I said so. We've always done this. You know, that, that doesn't lead them into good standing whenever they go into the world and the world is teaching them that homosexuality is okay. They're teaching that you can be whoever you want in your uh, gender. You can choose. And so we have to have these conversations younger to build that wisdom, that's, that's to build that wisdom in them because if we don't, the world's going to try to start 
dropping little things, and then now we're on the reactive side right. trying to do damage control, and that, that's not the job of our, as us as parents. You, we have to start from the womb. Right. You know, I say this little guy, but you got to even start earlier to making sure that you're in line so when the, they come out and look this cute right here, you know, you're not just like, oh, he's so cute, he's never going to do anything wrong. Because <laughs> he's got half of this guy in him, right? <laughs> Great point. Anybody else? I yes. do have a question. So I heard someone explain it this way. She said she um, had her granddaughter and like during the day and watched her during the day and then um, she was homeschooling her granddaughter and she said that she has to break her granddaughter's will while she's younger so that um, you know when she gets older that she doesn't deal with some of that rebellion and things like that. So my question is, do you agree with that statement? And then if so, then what, I guess, methods do you, would you say in terms of, like when they're young, not his age, but once they start being able to say no, <laughs> you know, that term of like breaking their phone. Let one. me leave. Yep. <laughs> I find that um, they are the way they are because God designed them that way. And you can try to break the will of a child and you will become extremely exhausted um, because they are made that way. Now, that doesn't mean you encourage disobedience or, or a bad behavior, but I think at some point you have to figure out, you know, why does a children act this, child act this way? God clearly made them this way, and how can I, how can I as a parent grow to, in order to... Um, help them to be successful as, as, a, as a boss or as an adult. I don't, I don't know that we were ever successful in breaking any will of our child, though we have strong-willed children. Um, but it, I, I just found, I don't know, you might have a different opinion on that, but I, just, I think that instead you figure out, okay, this isn't working. What, what can we do to cultivate what's going on in here? Maybe they're just a really strong leader. They have, they're, they have a really strong opinion. So how do we work that into success? And how do we work that for their good and not, you know, try to break them to what we feel like is good? Because, you know, that is how God made them. He designed them that way. Yeah, and I think there's a couple of things in that. So you said it was the grandmother. So what's happening at home? Like, is there consistency? Like, is the grandmother the only one trying to break the will? Or is the mom also part of this? Is, is there some type of consistency? First, first off, the, the second point is, <clears throat> I'll use an example. Landon was born left-handed. I'm right-handed. How do you raise a, raise a kid that's left-handed to be right-handed? So I spent a year of his life, because we weren't sure, I spent a year of his life trying to make him right-handed. It didn't work. <laughs> when he was little. He's, he, yeah, when he's little. Because he, I'm trying to teach him how to write. He's wanting to go to this hand. I'm like, I can't do anything with that hand. It's useless. I might as well put it behind my back. But but what I'm what the point I'm getting at is what exactly what she said was God made them that they made them that way. And I think there's different conversations in the whole breaking of somebody's will. Have you ever had your will broken? Is is not a good feeling. And, you know, when I think of breaking somebody's will, I think of, like, concentration camps, and I think of uh, uh, abuse at a certain level. Um, it, there, has, there has to be authority, but if, if the child is acting out to where they're screaming and doing those kind of things, I think there has to be conversations, no matter how big or how little they are, of why, why is this? And then some reflection of, okay, if I do this, does that cause them to do that? Remember, they're kids, and they're learning from us. So chances are the will that they have came from some things that we were doing, and now it's spread into them. Or they're in a situation where they're just not happy with what's going on. And, and how, how, do we, how do we work in that with these godly principles? I'm not a... I'm not sure at this point in time in my life, I'm a big fan of the word breaking somebody's will. I think we as Christians should be building people's will. 
And so to be who God has called us to be, well, how do you know who God called you to be at 12? Well, you do the same thing that Eli and Samuel and the training and the, and the working and the education and all that. I don't remember in the scripture anybody ever really breaking anybody's will uh, in that sense. And I know that's a tongue-in-cheek kind of kind of word, but um, I don't... Yeah. Is that... It's just a hard thing. I yeah, know that's something that, that um, you know, there a lot of inconsistencies so leads the, to bad behavior. The school systems, when you send a strong-willed child into the school, they will tell you they need Ridley. Because mm -hmm. they just need to calm down. Right? And if you Not, don't if you don't push on that, they will, you will walk that road. But it's... Every situation is unique, you know, so I'm, I'm not painting with a broad brush here. I'm just saying every kid, you're, you're going to look at him different than they're going to look at their child. And I'm going to look at my two kids. But when, you, when we try to paint with a broad brush to get somebody to fit into a box, is that kid really meant to be in that box? Or is that kid better off being who, who they're supposed to be? Does anybody want to add yeah. to that? Yeah, Jessica. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, um, I was just going to say, we're, we're living, exploring a strong little child right now. And Ryder, he has emotions. And he's trying to figure out how to contain them. And sometimes they're totally out of control. And our observation right now is, this might sound silly, but food is a big deal. So he, he has these naturally strong emotions. And if he has all this sugar and stuff, yeah. it just makes it so he can't control what's already strong. Yep. So we are just kind of trying, I'm watching and studying, you know, what are his triggers and trying to redirect his behaviors and just really honing in on, man, buddy, you did so good today. And really positive, calling out good things that he's doing. It's, it, it's just really intentional is what I'm finding and just making sure that you got to really look at the whole picture because there are things in our environments like loud sounds can really throw him off and it's just being in and being aware of what's what's happening is what i'm finding right now yeah and i'll interject before we move to lacy but i found that too with um with my kids with lane and especially he does not deal with um food the same way as other kids and so one thing that we had learned was that you got you know we're so used to feeding like pop tarts and you know all these pastries for breakfast and then we send them to school and then they're like you know hyper as can be so there's you know so and josh will say like he said they're going to want to say your kid's out of control we need to medicate but if you think of like okay let me try some things on my own let me just try and it's fine if that's where we got to go that's fine but let's just try to at least rule out some things like can I change his diet at home? Can I, you know, modify some things in his life to try to help um, him get some control over that? And and maybe it's not really a strong will at all. Maybe it's just their body reacting to something. I don't know. We're learning more as we grow, right? As we become more intelligent as a society. So, please. So I'm basically feeding off of what Jess just said. You know, uh, Braylon is a very, very emotional child. Um, she sometimes has, she's a lot like me. She has a hard time expressing those emotions well, and I've figured out more so recently with her, um, she does better when I refocus that issue or, or what emotion or whatever she's battling at the time and direct it somewhere else that can channel and explain why she's acting out the way she is. Um, one of the things that we have no or I've noticed at least um, be at home with her more often, is that if she gets extremely overwhelmed or too many buttons have been pushed or I have I have a bad habit of saying I need you to do this, 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 and by the time I've said the third or fourth thing, she can't remember yeah. what the first two things even were. Yeah. And it's something that I'm even trying to redo myself is I'm overwhelming her. I'm overloading her. I'm pushing a button. And now that I've figured that out, I'm able to redirect it and notice before the meltdown happens right. that, okay, this pushed a button way too far. And she needs step one and two, not three, four, and five. So we're learning as parents. Yeah. We are all learning. That's it. Like, 
one kid awesome. may be able to handle things a certain way and then the other one may not. And you're just, you just, God, the beautiful thing is God gave these children to you. You know, he knew when he picked them out uh, and gave them to you that you would be perfect for the, you're the parent that they need. And so what you do will be right. Yeah. I was just going to say one thing that we noticed when Sam started going to school, um, he would have really good days and come home and act like an absolute terror. And it finally occurred to us after talking to him, trying to figure out what's going on. And we found that telling him it's okay to, to not be perfect all day, every day, oh, yeah. it was like he responded with, wow, I don't have to be. Like he, he was trying so hard to be good at school, and then he had to come home and be a terrible Let it out. <laughs> he had yes. to get out somehow. <laughs> you know, whether it was he had to, you know, go somewhere and scream or, you know, hit a pillow or go run around outside or, but just him knowing that we didn't expect him to be perfect all the time really helped him. Oh. And he would sometimes just melt like it was just a really hard day and I just can't hold it anymore. Yeah. Like that. That's hard for the ones that are like teacher pleasers or people pleasers. You know, very, very hard. Like, we've got one of those, too. The other really thing we had himself. an issue with him was, if you don't know him, he won't shut up. And we send him to school, and then we come back with reports of he just keeps talking and yada, yada, yada. So we kind of tried to do a, a give and a take with him. Like, as much as it drives me nuts, the kid just sings and makes random noises all night. Yeah. But we told him, like, if you're quiet at school, like, whatever, you know, unload at home, right. just be quiet at school. So we did a compromise with him, like, try to be good, and then, yeah, just be loud and obnoxious at home, and we have to try to let him do it. Right. Which is so hard with his personality, because he's smart, and he's got a lot to say, and, you know, so... It is tricky when we put them in these big situations where there's 28 kids and they all can't talk at the same time, you know. Yeah. It's, they have to learn that. We had teachers tell us that he needed to be on, start trying to tell us that he had to be on medication. Yeah. It's like, no, he's, right. he's processing at a different rate than the rest of yes. you. Yeah, he's just, are you, are you entertaining him? Are, and that's are it. Are you intriguing him? Like, can he do extra work or whatever? And yes. Trying to push back and say, no, we, medication's not always the right. answer. Yeah. And we've noticed something at a at a probably a first grade, second grade age. Everybody now in school is at a different level. Mm -hmm. They're at the same level. I'm sorry, but they do not. And, and why why do I say this? It, it goes back to her breaking of the will. Everybody doesn't fit in the same. There are some second graders that are all the way up here, but the school is teaching them all the way down here because it's it's at the same level. So when you have these kids with all this, uh, what you, strong will is what we call them, really they're just kids. Um, when they have all of this, it's because they're not being challenged to a, a sense. I always uh, relate my parenting skills to the animal planet. Um, <laughs> and so I, I think, I, and I'm not an expert, but I have watched a few seasons of Heartland, um, the show with horses. And uh, you, you, you actually, when you started talking, I was thinking of horses with you and Chase over there. And you don't, you don't break a horse. You take a horse out, you let it run, you get it to where it's actually able to comprehend what you're trying to teach it. You know, there's lessons. It's the same with kids. You know, if they've got all this energy, don't make them sit down and listen because they are not going to do that. The same with us. We are not going to, we are not going to do that. So uh, great, great conversation. Any, Sorry yeah. I would just add that, you know, when we had um, our foster kid with us too, it was a totally different approach to figure out the difference in learning. And we learned that silly things like um, if you want to, if you can't pay attention and read at the table, can you pay attention and read while you're sitting under the table? Yeah. And it was just a whole different, you know, kind of thinking outside of the box for some of the kids or you know, we, we would just do the weirdest things to get him to focus or, um, so just trying to really tailor it to, right. tailor it to them. Like, oh, we can't make a mess here, but in a minute we're going to change clothes and we're going to go run through the rain and mud and puddles outside right. or, you know, just trying to do that. Yeah. And, and that speaks to the fact that you can't raise both kids the same. Exactly. There's consistency of this is a rule, but it's also a learning levels. Where you where you're gonna have to adapt and adjust because as much as I want Landon to be like Ashlyn, it's not gonna happen. He is not going to get his homework done and get straight A's and 
rise above and tell me that he loves me and all this stuff, he is going to be the one that gets right up in my face and says, why? Yes, he is the, he is the, the challenger. The challenger, and but, that's his personality But I, if I try to train them, raise them both the same, I'm back to the horse lingo, if I try to raise them both the same, it's not going to happen. I'm not going to get anywhere with them. And then I'm showing, really showing favoritism um, with her. Great, great, great uh, conversation. Anybody else want to throw anything out there? No. Well, let me get into these seven overlapping principles um, to go with our four godly traits. Oh, I so. Push the wrong button. He's still learning technology. I do. Number one uh, is love. Now we'll go to 1 John 4 and 10. And this is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the appropriation, that is, the atoning sacrifice and the satisfying offering for our sins, fulfilling God's requirement for justice against sin uh, and placating His wrath. So, forgetting the part about us atoning for their sins, in this is love, not that we love God. It's not for our children to love us. It's for us to love our children. And so when we talk about grouping this in with kindness, love is unconditional, is it not? Yes. Like, we hope that God loves us unconditionally. And we know that He went to Calvary because He does love us unconditionally. And we should not set our love and affection to our kids of, if you do this, I will love you. Right. But if you don't, I will be very upset at you. And I am not a big praise person. You know, I, I just, I'm not. I think you get your own praise. But there are times where, that's just me. There are times where kids need our praise. They, they need to know that they're loved. And because if they, we don't tell them, again, there's a whole world that's going to tell them to try to draw them away. Uh, number two, respect. Oh, I know this is a big one because, well, I'll give you respect when you give me respect. And then it's just a battle of nobody respecting anybody. Uh, but Paul said this in Philippians 2.3, uh, Do nothing uh, for selfishness or empty con uh, conceit uh, through faction. Oh, big words. You shouldn't have used the Amplified on I that I shouldn't one. have used the Amplified. Uh, motives or strife, but with an attitude of humility, being neither arrogant nor self-righteous, regarding others as more important than yourself. If we don't regard others more important as ourselves, then we are not following biblical That's principles true. anyway. Uh, because Jesus looked at this world to come to atone for this whole world's sins, no matter who people were, no matter what they looked like, no matter what they talked like, dressed like, we can all testify that there was times in our life that we weren't where we were supposed to be. But God still loved us. And when it comes to our children, it's not about getting them gaining their respect, getting them to respect us. It's about us respecting them. It's about showing them what that looks like. Because when they go into the world, there's no respect in the world. Everybody's trying to push the next guy down. And if they don't, they don't see this at home, that, hey, I know you're acting out, but I still, there's still respect, there's still admiration, there's still all of this there, then where are they going to find it from? They're not. They're, they're going to have uh, some, some deals when they get older of, why was my... Why was my parents this way to me, but this is what the Bible says to, that I'm supposed right. to be, and there's going to be this, this conundrum. I think, before you move on, just yep. a quick note in there is it's really important to, to teach them to respect their elders and to respect, if it's a boy, to respect a lady. Yeah, good point. Um, this is something when you have two boys and two girls in your house, they don't look at their sister as a lady. They look at it as a punching bag, or you know what I mean? They really do. I mean, look at Bradley and Brayden and Kylie. It's just they don't view that. So it's a constant reminder of, hey, I know that that's your sister, but she's a lady. And you don't do that to a lady. So, you know, we don't want the world to define them like, oh, I, you know, I don't have to treat her differently because she's a female. You do have to treat her differently. You yeah. do. And, and it's, this isn't a marriage class, but it's here too. Yeah. If there's no respect in arguments, they're, they're in the house, <laughs> right. and your walls aren't that thick. They're, they're listening to everything you say, and if there's not respect in conversation, well, then they pass that down to their siblings, and, you know, and, and then it just carries out into they're getting fights and stuff like that because they're just, that's what they're seeing at home. Um, great point. And the elders, I think, is a big thing, too. I mentioned it at the beginning, but we need to make sure they know 
that, you know, they see someone to hold the door open for them. If they see someone carrying something heavy, go pick that up and take, you know, take it for them. So those are kind of part of um, the go against culture, but it is a beautiful servanthood type of a role that they can fill. Uh, number three, intentionality. Uh, Colossians 1 and 10. So that you will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, displaying admirable character, moral courage, and personal integrity, to fully please Him in all things, bearing fruit in every good work, and steadily growing in the knowledge of God with deeper faith, clear insight, and fervent love for His precepts. When we talk about intentionality, our, we are raising our children to be intentional. They are literally disciples of who we are. And so intentionally, we have to live the life that we want them to live. We can't intentionally not teach them how to read and expect them to be doctors. Mm -hmm. we, we, we can't do that. We, we can't not give them the tools and expect them to be something better than that we are. And I would hope that as parents and as biblical parents, the same as Christ wants more for us, He said, you'll do greater signs than these. He, he didn't say you'll do the same. He said you'll do greater. Greater work shall you do in my name. And as parents, we should want our children to do greater, but we have to be intentional um, about making sure that we're giving them the proper tools and, and things to be uh, to use. And that goes not just biblical tools, but as you grow, as you raise different kids, you got to try to see what is you're talking. We were talking about strong-willed children. Yeah. What is their what is their gifting? You know what what is it? You know um, I'm going to just bring in this guitar and see if anyone has a desire to play with it. You know how many guitars we brought bought <laughs> and no one plays with it, but someone has to have this gifting. We buy drums pianos. and pianos, and you know is there anyone that has you know. A desire to do this so you have to kind of give them the tool um, you know we thought Landon he loves computers maybe he wants to be a coder well let's get you some stuff maybe you want to be a programmer hated that was a it. bad idea because he's a lot smarter on devices now than we are that is a true thing <laughs> but he hated it so we ruled that out that okay that's not the path for him but you know what I mean like you have to give them tools to see you yeah. know do they like 4-H do they like animals you know just kind of Testing the waters. And, and it's, a, it's better to do it in, in the environment where you can control it than to just let the world, let them figure out where, where that intention is. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we, yes, go ahead. Sorry, you want? Uh, no, we had something that happened several years back. He said 4-H and it popped in my head. Tessa was going through a funk where she was just like down in the dumps consistently. And she just broke down one night. She's like, no, I'm not creative. And she's like, I can't do anything, I have no value, and it, I was like, no, she was so blind to all of these things she was doing, so we thought, you know, we've been trying to get them into 4-H, and our, that was our avenue, we got them into 4-H, and we opened her up to sewing, and to all of this different stuff, and suddenly she's like, she knows how to sew her own stuff, she's getting on the computer, she's designing things in Canva, she's like all of these different avenues, because it was like we saw she was believing a lie, like yep. we saw that she was creative and we're like, nope, we're just going to dispel this right now for you and find all of these little ways for her to figure it out on her own, but just exactly what you're saying, put those things in their hands so that they can see that, hey, and yeah. if they don't, then that's fine. But yeah. at least you give them the opportunity. And it's not about living, living. I think a lot of parents get stuck in this one, living their life through their children, where you say, my son, my son is going to play football. You know, and then so every the only tool you give them is a football. Sorry, Jake, you're going to be my boy tonight. <laughs> <laughs> so everything you give them is a football. It might not work that way. And, and then, then we get upset because they're not what we're supposed to be. And then there becomes resentment and all that because all he ever wanted to do was play baseball. And right. he never put a glove in the hand. And so when we, when we look at that, we think the church has to be the one who sets up our kid's life of where they're going in the direction. And they're going to get God's will. And, and I'm teaching a class on God's will later on. That all cultivates from the home. Because it, the same way we feel that the Lord moves through the pastor, then through the church, it's the same way at home. The Lord through, moves through the head, through the body, through the children. And if we're not seeking God's will for what our kids' life is supposed to be so that we can put these tools out there to, to check them, how are they ever going to know? 
They're not. You know what they're going to do? They're going to get into the hyphen group, and these guys can speak to this. They're going to get into the hyphen group, and then they're going to start going, I'm 18. Now i got to figure out what to do. And the world comes at them like, yeah. like that. And now they're just out there looking. They're grabbing whatever they can be, whatever they can get their hold on, hands onto, because the home was never intentional with, let's try this. Let's try it. We, we went from a cello to a right. piano, back to a cello to, you know, and that's just instruments, but other things. Well, and it sets their mind, too, if they think I have, there's only one will for me. And yeah. That's it. My, God's will for me is to be a youth pastor. And then I'm never picked to be a youth pastor. Well, what in the world? At least it sets them up to be like, I'm going to explore other options. You know, maybe it's not. Well, maybe I want to be a music leader. Or maybe I want to be something else. But when you teach them at a young age, you know, try things and see if, if that's a skill for you, you know. Things is taste and see. Yeah. Taste, taste. Uh, let's, let me go on. I'm going to cut out of time. Uh, number four is boundaries and limits. Uh, we talked about this with the godly structure. Uh, number five, gratitude. Number five, gratitude, Philippians 1, 3 through 4. I thank my God in every remembrance of you, always offering every prayer of mine with joy, uh, with this specific, with this specific request uh, for all of you. Um, the gratitude, we talked about a little bit about on Thanksgiving. You know, it's not just a season, but always having this gratitude in our lives and displaying that to our kids. If we're constantly a negative Nelly, our kids are going to be negative Nellies. So if we constantly show gratitude, our kids are going to constantly show gratitude. And then you know what you're going to hear from your teachers? You have the sweetest child. Yeah. Yeah. They're not doing anything else right, but they are the sweetest. <laughs> that's okay. You did something right. And that's okay. You'll take the win. <laughs> because you're, you're just like, yes, <laughs> praise the Lord. Take the win. <laughs> Thank you for gratitude. Number six, uh, grace and forgiveness. Uh, I think that speaks for itself when we come to godly parenting. Uh, this is a principle that we need to have in our life. If if our kid ruined the nicest rug or cut our car, they were washing the car. You remember those mitts that you used to wash your car with? Mm -hmm. My dad let me wash the car, but we didn't have a, a concrete driveway. We had a gravel driveway. And I had put the mitt in the gravel, and it was like small little rocks. And then I picked it back up because my hand was wet. I didn't want my hand to be wet, so I dried it off just to stick it back in the wet glove, and then I just went right down the side of that. You know, I, was, I thought I was doing my best cleaning that car, because it looked white, but it really the white wasn't the bubbles, it was the scratches from the rock down the side. And so, uh, Grace. Grace. I didn't get Grace, but there's... <laughs> <laughs> but you would extend Grace. I would extend That's Grace. How. And so no matter, no matter what we have that our, that our children quote unquote do or don't do we need to make sure to have that grace and forgiveness because it's the same if we can't forgive how do we expect him to forgive it's it's biblical principles um and then number seven is adaptability uh paul says in philippians 4 11, not that i speak from any personal need for i have learned to be content and self-sufficient through christ satisfied to the point where i am not disturbed or uneasy regardless of my circumstances no matter what the situation is with the kids, we've got to be able to adapt. I heard a word at leadership was pivot. You know, I just thought that was basketball. But we've got to be able to pivot. You're not moving your plant foot. You're not moving your ground. You're not changing. But you've got to be able to adapt to the situations. Because if we just think we can stand there solid, they're going to mow right through us. And we've got to be able to adapt and overcome. And this is exactly what Paul was talking about, regardless of the circumstances. Regardless if they come home bawling, regardless if they have the best day, we've got to be the best godly parents that we can be because this world is just getting darker. That's not a scare tactic the church uses. I hope we can all see that. It is reality. And just because you think Congress stopped this wave or whatever was coming doesn't mean there's not another one and another one and another one. So we've got to make sure that we are the best biblical parents that we can be in order for our kids to have a chance.